Good evening, everyone. Before we begin, I'll ask everyone, please silence uh, cell phones and or other electronic devices. And I'll call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. by recognizing the traditional keepers of this land and specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga and Anishinaabek territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. The Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nations are the collective stewards and care these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We'll move into the approval of the agenda with a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, pardon me, a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Ferretis. The Council approved the December 19th, 2022 Council agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motions carry. Members of Council, do you have any declarations of pecuniary interest? And if so, please state the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Move into announcements, but before we do, and as part of our announcements, we will be making two presentations. So Chief and Deputy Chief, I will ask you to please come forward. And you want me to call the gents up now, both gentlemen up now, or one at a time? Very well. So we'll wait for you guys to come on up here. We'll use this one. So the first presentation is to Jamie Gibbons on his retirement. Jamie, will you step on up here, please? So we're presenting Jamie with a certificate that reads in recognition of service, Jamie Gibbons on behalf of the members of municipal council and the citizens of Brighton, we extend our sincere gratitude for your 18 and a half years of service to the Brighton community on Brighton Fire and Rescue. I'm told your willingness to share knowledge and sense of humor will be missed around the station. As you reflect on your career, we hope you look back fondly on your time spent with Brighton while also looking forward to your retirement ahead. Congratulations. Thank <laughs> you. 
20 years and we both made diapers and that yeah. was uh yeah. we've always had that long-standing joke about uh, knowing each other since we we're in diapers so congratulations thank you uh yeah i can i just like to um, thank all the previous administration and the fire department for actually thinking about hiring me i hope i've done well for the community from what i've heard from the other firefighters i think i've been a positive influence and i continue to keep my positive influence going throughout the community. And one point I'd like to make is Gene was my first deputy chief and now he's my last. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard, we'll get you to come up. Richard is receiving his exemplary service medal of, for 20 years of service. Because of Richard's service, he's getting three certificates and we start closest to the crown. So the first one comes from the governor general and it reads the fire services exemplary service is awarded to Richard Plumpton in recognition of 20 years of loyal and exemplary service to public safety in Canada. And it's signed by her excellency. And one from uh, MPP Pacini on behalf of the government of Ontario and as your member of provincial parliament, it is my honor to extend a sincere congratulations to Richard Plumpton on in recognition of his 20 years of service. Thank you for over 20 years of service with the Brighton Fire and Rescue as a firefighter. It gives me great pleasure to recognize your dedication and commitment to your community. You have my sincere thanks and appreciation for the positive impact you have on your community. Your ability to help us in a time of need and maintain our safety should not go unrecognized. Thank you and all the best in the future. Signed, David Piccini. And this one's from us, Richard. In recognition of exemplary service, Richard Plumpton, on behalf of the members of Municipal Council and the citizens of Brighton, we would like to thank you for your 24 years of outstanding service to the Brighton community with Brighton Fire and Rescue and congratulate you on receiving the exemplary service medal. I am told that you are the, quote, road atlas for rural Brighton and a go-to member of the group because of your work and ethic and skill. Thank you for your service and congratulations. Yeah, I just, I just, I can remember getting the phone for my, my interview way back when, and uh, best move I ever made. It let me do a career in firefighting. I'm a full-time firefighter now, and uh, it's been the best move I ever made and the best bunch of guys I work with. Just really appreciate the opportunities I've been given. Thank you. Thank you both again for your service to the community. It is incredibly appreciated. Are there any other announcements this evening? Try to top those. 
Councillor Rowley. Santa Claus tops everyone. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so um, I just want to say that on Saturday, the DBIA hosted Santa in uh, Brighton. Lucky for us to have him here. Uh, we were able to see a lot of kids. Smithfield Public School benefited by uh, a donation from not only the DBIA, but uh, from donations from all of those uh, parents who helped attend. So uh, thank you, everyone. And hopefully we'll see Santa again soon and next year for sure in the park. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else? On, oh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Well, I don't wanna leave this one out. Uh, I was fortunate to attend the County of Northumberland Council meeting last week and uh, it's all big news now, everybody knows about it, but I'd like to congratulate our mayor on becoming the deputy mayor for Northumberland. Warden. 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 <laughs> There's so many deputy jokes going around. There, there were a lot of deputy jokes. Yeah, yeah a lot. Of <laughs> but anyhow, we won't go there. Anyhow, congratulations, Mayor and uh, Ward, Deputy Ward. Thank you. Appreciate that, Deputy Mayor. Appreciate that very much. Any other announcements? On uh, uh, was it Thursday? Thursday we held our staff uh, council Christmas party, and um, I think it's important to announce that. Uh, my team was the winner of the Cahoots trivia game. Uh, the The award was handed to the uh, Minor Niners. Our table was not, not table nine, and uh, I'd like to thank Deputy uh, Mayor Anderson and Councillor Wielden and Councillor Fredis, Director Walsh, and Mr. Hagerman for um, getting us to the top. It was uh, it was quite the struggle. Uh, one time we weren't even on the board, so uh, this is this was this was a really hard fought battle. And uh, we came out on top of and we did not cheat. <laughs> I wouldn't have even known how to cheat in that game. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was a, and it was a good turnout and it was uh, really well organized. I, I offered thanks that day, but I'll thank them again. The thanks to the, the social committee who put it all together. It was a, it was a really good event. Really nice just to be able to gather and have, have everyone together again too. Any other announcements? We'll go on to the adoption of the minutes with a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Fredis, that Council adopt the December 5th, 2022 Council meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? Councillor Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just, um, in the minutes, we um, were at our um, December 2nd, um, whatever meeting that date that was, we spoke about the KPMG uh, report and um, having reread some of that, I was just wondering if, um, and if not tonight, maybe staff can maybe email something to the rest of council. Uh, part of part of the um, the scope of the work that we had kind of um, asked for from KPMG was recommendations, and then how to roll them all out as as we move forward. Um, I didn't see any um, any indication of that or any specifics as how we're going to move this forward. So I'm just wondering, um, maybe Mr. Castleman can answer. Is there a plan to uh, still work with KPMG to come up with some kind of plan to to roll out some of these recommendations? Mr. Castleman? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, certainly, um, as a result of the um, adoption of the KPMG study, uh, staff had indicated at that time that they would uh, be moving forward with an implementation strategy. That's still uh, still the in the plans. Uh, obviously, our first priority was to complete the 2023 budget, which uh, is nearing completion right now. And I trust that uh, council will have their copy by the end of this week. So certainly, that's been priority number one in December for the staff. We will be quickly turning our mind to uh, the KPMG study and putting together an implementation strategy and bring it forward for council's consideration. That'll be priority number two, uh, certainly in the January, February uh, timeframe. Thank you. And I, I think the question, Mr. Castleman, was will, will KPMG be involved in um, consulting on or helping with that implementation strategy? Uh, cer certainly uh, as needed, uh, um, they've provided a framework for staff to work with and certainly if there's some questions for from a clarity perspective uh, staff will not hesitate to reach out to kpmg thank you anything further from members of council 
All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion is carried. The motion moved by Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Ferretis, the Council adopt the planning meeting minutes of December 12th, 2022 as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion is carried. That brings us to our public meeting for this evening. The municipality takes steps to keep the public informed and provide opportunity to make comment ask question and provide feedback and advice on decisions that come before council. In some cases, the municipality has a statutory duty to provide an official public meeting, as is the case this evening with the introduction of the 2023 fees and charges. So Director Rudifield, can you please explain the purpose of tonight's public meeting? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, so we presented a report on December the 5th. Um, with the proposed fees and charges for 2023. And um, we um, advertised for a public meeting, which is uh, being held this evening. And the purpose is to uh, allow the public to speak to council on the proposed fees and charges um, with, um, you know, any comments that they wish to make on the, on the fees that have been proposed. Thank you, Director. Do you have any comments on the report? No, thank you. Are there any persons present or joining us virtually have questions and comments about the 2023 fees and charges report? Mr. Green, please come forward. No, thank you for the record, David Green. Um, I noticed on the fees and charges that there appears to be a number of new charges being proposed. And I'm wondering why now or, or even were these forgotten in the past? There's a, an unusual number of new charges where they were not applicable and now there's a fee attached. And a couple of increases really stand out. <clears throat> Water going from $1.52 to $1.75, that's a 15% increase. Sewage rates going 158 to 181 an increase of 14%. And I understand that this is a user pay system, but really that, that's an increase that appears to be out of line. I know about the 2018 study, but is that a fair and equitable increase for users of the system? And then I get to my best one. I'm glad I'm not going to be a taxi cab in Brighton. The rates on taxi cabs are absolutely astronomical. There's a 300% increase for a taxi cab license and a 1000% increase for each driver. So I'm not sure if we want to discourage taxi service in Brighton, but this is certainly one way to do that. And as an added comment, if I may, the Brighton guest internet is uh, not cooperating tonight and hasn't cooperated and is, can be seen as frustrating for those of us in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Director, I guess I'll ask you to make comment on the three questions. Um, why all the new charges is the first one. Um, so our water and wastewater rate charges um, are found within our um, water and wastewater rate study that was uh, undertaken in 2017, I believe it was. And um, we've continued on with those rates and uh, while we prepare to do a new rate study. Um, the 15% is based on just the usage uh, rate, not the base rate. And so um, it, it doesn't blend out to anywhere near that. Um, I, I have to refer to those water fees and charges because I think we may have spoken about that in here. Um, so the, the base rates are monthly and they went up, I think, 2%. And then the usage rates did go up 15%. That's controllable by the user um, in, in a lot of respects. So um, those that maybe have swimming pools they fill or have sprinkler systems uh, may pay more than, than the average for four-person family home um, that uses water for cooking and cleaning and, and bathing. Um, the, like I said, they were found within the rate study. 
um, and we followed that rate study throughout and we'll continue to do so because that is what's been approved by council in the past. Um, as far as taxi cabs and drivers, um, I would have to um, ask Mr. Walsh to um, comment on those rates. Mr. Walsh. To the Mayor to Council, the percentage increase rates that were cited uh, by Mr. Green are, are accurate. Uh, the rates would be going from uh, $80 per cab to $250 per cab. And to get a cab, you have to get a, a plate or you know, a taxi plate. And there's only a certain number of places that make those and they are tend to be expensive. So I, I would say that we're, we may even be losing money at the new rate of $250 per cab. And then the yeah, rate for $20 per driver to $200 per driver, that is just reflective of the number of years without adjustments. And we've looked at comparable rates in other jurisdictions and, and basically fitted into comparable ju jurisdictions. Um, if uh, the council is of the, of the mind to take another look at that and get a fuller scope of jurisdictional practices in that regard, staff are happy to follow up on that. Um, so, uh, in terms of the other charges out there, you'll see a lot of charges that are to do with, uh, what's anticipated for the administrative monetary penalty bylaw. Uh, so it's, in, it's better to have those, those, uh, penalty rates in this bylaw as opposed to separate and in its own, uh, series of bylaws. So what we're really seeing are, are some are in existing bylaws and now they've just been brought forward and put into the fees and charges bylaw for the first time. So they many of them are found elsewhere. So they're not they're not new to the municipality. They're just new to this spreadsheet. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. For, predominantly. Right. But there's quite a few that are new that uh, didn't have an, an we'll call an AMP. Yeah. But, uh, uh, administrative monetary penalty reflected previously. Uh, in particular things like um, the short-term accommodations. And can you just, for council and the public's uh, edification, just the difference between um, a, an administrative monetary penalty and, and a provincial offenses penalty, essentially? Sure, sure. So uh, as the name suggests, it's a, it's a penalty because it's um, a cause for this penalty to invoke its bail enforcement services. So in a sense, it's almost like a, a, a fee for service. It's a, a negative service, but it's still a fee for service as opposed to a fine. So under the Provincial Offensive Act, it would be uh, administered as a fine if it was so ordered uh, through, um, through uh, an offense uh, and ordered by the court. So it's the difference between a penalty and a fine of, of sorts. Or, uh, yeah, and, uh, and with the uh, administrative monetary penalties, those revenues stay within the coffers of the municipality of Brighton as opposed to going to the provincial offenses coffers. So it stays locally. And because they're much more easier to administer, there's no uh, procedure in terms of going to a court and the time and expense of, of all that involves. Uh, it tends to also, one, be much more cost effective to administer uh, and highly so, but also um, the ease of which it can be applied, usually it gets applied to either the land, uh, it can get be collected as taxes, so there's not really an option to collect or not, <laughs> it's there, uh, or if it's a vehicle, and normally with something to do with parking, and then it's collected at the time of plate renewal. So there's really not a, a lot of option to the person who's, uh, who's uh, in non-compliance with their bylaws, the collection shall happen. Uh, and so compliance rates are much, much higher than provincial offenses. And many, if not most municipalities uh, are moving that direction. So I think council can hear in the future that we'll um, needing to get a hearings officer um, contracted for uh, as required under the municipal act to administer uh, um, the, the bylaw. Uh, so if someone wants to appeal the, the, uh, the offense that's uh, been applied to them, then they have the right of an appeal to a hearings officer. And staff been talking with the town of Coburg who've already 
as a hearings officer, uh, um, I understand under contract. So the questions of um, equitability with regard to water rates, water and sewer rates, that door appears to be locked. Sorry, the question with regard to the equitability of water and sewer rates and um, and the taxi, the new taxi rates. I don't know if there's an equitability question or is is it really just why are we bouncing at this high? Um, we we the former council asked for some comparators with regard to water rates a couple of years ago and found out that we were um, one of the lower, actually one of the lower rates of comparable size municipalities or even in our own neighborhood, so to speak. And uh, I, I assume that you mentioned that you looked at comparable comparative size municipalities for taxi rates, Mr. Walsh. That's correct. Yes, okay. I can I can revisit that and look at other you know more jurisdictions than what I than what I did, but I can. Uh, we'll, we'll do for the research if so desired. We'll see what council wants to do. Is this a follow up to these questions, or is it a new question altogether? Uh, it's a, a follow up or a point of clarity. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, just so I make sure that I understand what, what you just explained about the uh, administrative penalties. Basically, it, it takes staff time to process paperwork caused by someone breaking a bylaw. And so this is, uh, this is our way of charging the person who generated that paperwork for the processing thereof. Is that the simple way of saying it? That's the simple way of saying it. Yeah, nicely put. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, further clarity on another point you made earlier, because um, it was the question I, I brought tonight. Um, some of the new fees that are appearing here um, relate to bylaws that have been around for some time, um, but they were just previously recorded elsewhere as part of that bylaw and they've just been moved in. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. And Mr. Green, thank you for your questions. Are, are there, is there anyone else present or coming in virtually as questions with regard to the report? Are there any questions from members of council? Director Whitfield, do you have any final comments? I'd be happy to share that email with the new council as well. Um, the comparators that we did, I think it was just last year. I think it was just last year. And I'd be happy to send that out as well. Um, would you, when you do that, would you up, update the information for the municipality of Brighton so that we're 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 not comparing apples to apples, but we're comparing the new our new schedule with last year's surrounding areas schedule or perhaps provide both for Brighton. Yeah, I'll provide both. Thank you. That would be good. Thank you. Um, and Director Woodfield, when will we see a, a bylaw come forward? Um, the first meeting in January is the soonest we can bring that forward. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Butwell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Anderson, that Council receive comments from the public regarding fees and charges or services by law. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. That brings us into the presentation portion of the meeting. Council will hear two presentations this evening. Presenters have 15 minutes to provide Council with their information. It is noted that language, content, and conduct must remain respectful at all times. Council will be provided with an opportunity to ask questions of clarification from the presenters based on the information they have presented. Council is reminded this is not an opportunity to engage in, the, in debate with the delegate nor advance a public policy position. Presenters are reminded that Council does not make decisions during the pre presentation portion of the meeting. And although I did say presenters have 15 minutes, uh, we are likely to see the auditors go over the 15 minute timeline. And with Council's permission, we're just going to allow them to carry on. Um, it's important information that we receive. I think the fulsome report. That said, our first presenter is Joanna Park and John Hickey, Baker Tilly auditors presentation. And I think it's uh, Joanna that's on screen. It is, thank you very much, Mayor and the rest of council. It's ha I'm happy to be here tonight and to present the audit findings for the 2021 audit. Um, if it's okay with you, I will share my screen. Please do. Okay. 
The only thing I'm concerned about is occasionally I have trouble stopping sharing my screen. So hopefully at the end of my presentation, we'll figure that out. <laughs> yes, we'll hope so. <laughs> yeah, Zoom and I don't always get along. But anyway, we will continue on at the moment. Um, thank you very much for having me. I do have the, uh, in your packages or in your agenda packages, you have your 2021 audited financial statements and draft, uh, a letter from us to you to tell you how the audit went, and then as well as this presentation. And I'm going to go through the presentation, which is a nice kind of summary of the other two documents. But of course, at the end of my presentation, I'm happy to address any questions that you might have in the other two documents as well. What we start with is the most important paragraph of the auditor's report. Uh, the auditor's report is two pages long now, but the, this is the second paragraph in the auditor's report, and this is what you want to see. And it says, in our opinion, the accompanying financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the municipality at December 31st, 2021. So this is a clean auditor's opinion and what you would expect to see. Um, a few notes here that it does talk about consolidated because not only do these financial statements uh, include the results of the municipality, but also the results of the library, as well as the downtown business improvement area, which are uh, your local boards as well. There is also a um, paragraph in the auditor's report that uh, talks about that the audits, uh, audited financial statements last year were given a clean auditor's opinion as well by another group of auditors, as this is our first year as audit and, and again, um, I can't stress enough that we're happy to be here as your auditor. There are uh, certain items that as council members, you uh, were required to let you know about. And uh, basically the first part is just the audit procedure. So uh, we do review your closed and your open uh, minutes of council to ensure that anything financial is actually reflected in your financial statements. We do uh, different types of sub substantive testing, sampling, analytical review, management estimates. We ensure that that's all reasonable as well. And then we review your main system. So the money going in, the money going out, your revenues, your disbursements, your payroll, as well as journal entries. And if we came across any um, you know, areas where we thought the controls needed to be strengthened, we would bring them to management. But at this point, we do not have any recommendations in that area. The audit is complete pending council's approval of the financial statements. And once that happens, then we will ask for a signed representation uh, letter from management to, uh, acknowledging that they've provided us everything we need to do our audit, as well as we ask for legal confirmation. So this is to ensure that there's no um, outstanding legal matters that uh, we didn't, weren't aware of that may or may not have to be disclosed or recorded in your financial statements. We didn't have any difficulties or issues during the audit. No change to our initial audit plan. It was delayed a little bit uh, due to timing on both sides, but uh, you know, in a first year audit, it always takes a little longer than anticipated, but I think uh, both, both parties, both sides, we anticipate next year to be a normal timeline. Um, excellent cooperation. And uh, one thing we just note here that there is still an uncertainty uh, to your future financial statements due to COVID-19. So there is a no in your financial statements to this regard. And the last point on this slide is that we had no uncorrected uh, audit differences uh, during our audit. Then we get into the numbers of the financial statements and what we've done instead of showing you all the numbers on one slide, um, we've kind of broken it up into pieces. So the first one is your statement, uh, on your statement of financial position is your financial assets. So these are all the assets that can more easily be converted into cash, your largest one being your cash and temporary investments at $15.3 million. A nice increase from the year before, and that's primarily due to the increase in your reserves and your reserve funds. You do have some accounts receivable, $2.2 million, and that's gonna um, fluctuate year over year, just depending on the timing. A lot of that has to do with HST, as well as your water and sewer uh, receivables at the end of December, and that, those are the largest components of that amount. You have taxes receivable, $1.6 million, and you can see from number, you know, year over year that there's been a nice decrease there, which is expected, to, especially being 2020 in the, you know, the middle of, well, was, I'm not sure it was the middle of COVID, but at the end of the first year of COVID. Um, one thing to note, we look at the percentages uh, of what your taxes receivable are based to, on your total um, tax base. And in 2020, it was 9.4%. And in 2021, it was 7.9%. So that's a nice decrease there. The ministry looks at this and their guideline is 10%. So 
even at last year with a little bit higher, last year being 2020, sorry, um, you were still under that recommended guideline of 10%. And then you have some inventory for resale, that's all within the cemetery. And then your assets held for sale, that's industrial land, giving you your total financial assets of $19.4 million. And then we just show a graphical representation here so you can see over the years. And then as, as we're uh, auditors for longer period of time, we'll be able to give you more of a five-year trend. This is a little um, skewed just with the, the significant balance you have in your cash and temporary investment balance. And then we look at your financial liabilities, the amounts owing at the end of the year are sitting as a liability. Um, you have $4.2 million in accounts payable and accrued liabilities. And again, that's gonna fluctuate just on the timing of your projects um, and timing of payments. Um, but $1.8 million of that 4.2 is developer deposits. So that's sitting on hand in all the development that's going on in the municipality. Your deferred revenue obligatory reserve fund, that's the amounts that you've received for funding that. Uh, for your primarily your gas tax as well as your development charges. So that's the amount that you have on hand that you have not yet spent. So of that $5.4 million, 3.7 is development charges and 1.2 million is gas tax. Your deferred revenue other, that's other types of funding that has not uh, been spent yet and it's sitting there waiting for future uh, periods. And one, uh, that's $1.3 million. Most of that is OSIP funding. And then the long-term debt, $7.5 million. There was no new debt this year. That's just being reduced by the principal payments uh, year over year. And then again, a graphical representation, you can see kind of the, the changes year over year. And then we look at your non-financial assets. So these are the assets that you're holding on for longer periods of time, not as easily to convert to cash. And your biggest one being your tangible capital assets at $78.2 million. And this is the historical cost of those assets. So your roads, your water and sewer infrastructure, you know, buildings, land, um, the historical cost of those items minus the accumulated amortization. So they get, they get expensed over the useful life of the assets. So you'll notice an increase this year, and that's because your additions were about $3.5 million. Um, and that uh, plus then two, uh, two million dollars of contributed assets as well. So that was more than the amortization during the period. When you take your net financial assets, which is your financial assets minus your liabilities, plus the non-financial assets, you get that $79.2 million at the bottom and that's your accumulated surplus. And we will see that further on in the slides. And this is just looking at your tangible capital assets. We talked about the fact you have uh, over $5 million of additions this year, and this is in the areas that they are, uh, that they are, what types of assets I should, I guess I should say they are. So about 3.9 million in roads and bridges, one point, to almost 1.4 million for your water and sewer are the main ones there. And then looking at the trends, just how much, uh, your amortization is versus your capital assets. And this is uh, capital asset additions. And this is a good one to look at trends over time, just ensuring that you are replacing your assets at a higher rate than the amortization. The amortization is based on the uh, historical cost of the assets. So of course, as we all know, things are getting more and more expensive uh, now. So you wanna make sure that you're replacing them at a higher rate or you're gonna end up you know, in that uh, infrastructure deficit as, uh, you know, was talked about a lot in the municipal world a few years ago. And then this just looks at the average useful life by class of assets. And this is just kind of a snapshot picture. It doesn't, definitely doesn't tell the whole story, but it's good to see. Um, the one thing you'll notice there is your vehicles are the ones with the least amount of remaining useful life, which you would expect because they would have the uh, shorter amount of useful life estimated for the vehicles versus something like a building, which is going to last a lot longer. So then we look at the accumulated surplus. So we talked about the $79.2 million. And this is uh, the breakdown of the accumulated surplus. You have about $68 million invested in capital assets. And that's the net book value of the capital assets that we saw a few slides before less any long-term debt associated with those assets, minus unfunded capital. So you do have some projects that are just being financed internally um, through your budget process. 
and that's uh, netted out there as well. The municipality did have an operating surplus of 89,923 this year. So um, that will be, I know historically that um, any surpluses have been transferred to reserves in the following period, which is what happened in the year before, 634,000 was transferred into your contingency reserve. And then the library board has an $83,000 accumulated surplus and the DBIA has a $17,000 accumulated surplus. The rest of your $79.2 million has been um, already put into reserves and reserve funds, $10.7 million, a nice increase from about $1.5 million from the year before, of which of that increase is part of that is the $634,000, which was the 2020 operating surplus. There you can see the trend just in the two years of the reserves and reserve funds, and you can see that increase um, year over year. The other thing we look at is the accumulated surplus and how much of that 79.2 million is already invested in capital assets, meaning that you don't have the funds to invest in other things. Um, so you'll notice in 2021, much different than the year before where there is a gap between the amount invested in capital assets for your TCA balance, I should say, and the accumulated surplus. So that's really made, um, made up of the amount invested you already have in reserves and reserve funds. So that's good to see. I will, uh, just while we're talking a little bit about accumulated surplus, quite often in my presentations, the one thing I get asked is, you know, do we have enough in our reserves and reserve funds? And, uh, you know, my common answer is this is where the asset management plan comes into place, um, making sure that uh, you're looking at your future requirements and your needs um, down the road, you know, there may be roads that you know even 10 years out, bridges, that kind of thing. You really need to look at that and look at the future capital needs to make sure you're going to have those funds on hand. The next slide is a snapshot of your consolidated statement of operations. We're going to see it in more detail on the next slides. But what I really put this slide before you because I don't want anyone looking at the statement of, uh, of the income statement essentially and seeing that you know, PSAB annual surplus of over $5 million in the budget column. You know, I don't want anyone to say, hey, we, you know, council would never have approved a $5 million um, surplus. And that's right, you didn't uh, when it comes to, this is a PSAB annual surplus. And so what this does down below is it shows the difference between how you budget and what, how we have to show it as on the financial statements. There is a difference because the budgeting process is more on a cash basis. Um, where it doesn't take into account the amortization, but it does show you the you know, tangible capital assets in your budget as an expense. So that's what the purpose of this slide is, is to show that reconciliation down to the zero that you did actually budget. So, um, and the same within the actuals, it's showing the you know, $4.1 million, but I told you um, that there was a change in that surplus of 544,000. So that's the that's what this slide is doing is just showing the items that are different between the accounting on the finan audited financial statements and how you're budgeting. And then this slide just shows the difference between your revenues and your expenses. Um, during 2021, you got uh, $2.7 million of contributed capital for your Applewood Meadows subdivision. And that's probably predominantly why you have that gap here between the revenue and the expenses. Um, the roads and the water and sewer were all contributed as the assumption of the subdivision. So the, all that showed as revenue in your financial statements. And then those items will be expensed over their useful life. So that's um, why the gap there. And then we get into the revenue. So in total, you had budgeted just over $22 million and your actual uh, about $21.3 million. Your largest revenue is your property taxation at $10.5 million. You have user charges of just under $5 million, of which three and a half million of that is your water and sewer. And then your planning and zoning and building permits as well as parks and rec are the, the biggest user charges in there. You do have some funding, of course, from the government of Canada and the province of Ontario, um, amounting to about just over 1.3 million, $1.4 million there. Um, the other item noted on here, the big one here, is that donated in, uh, on your 
final financial statements, I think contributed is probably a better word there than donated tangible capital assets, $2.7 million. So that's the amount for the Applewood Minerals uh, subdivision there, the, as I just mentioned. And then on development charges and parkland fees earned, that's the amount that was spent during the year. So we talked about how much you have on hand for future periods. These are the amounts that were spent during 2021 on various uh, projects. So that gives you your $21.3 million in total revenue. And then again, we do a pie chart just to kind of see the snapshot. And you can see 49.3% uh, of your revenue is coming from property taxation and another 23% from user charges. And then the expenses, uh, the public sector accounting board standards require us to show expenses two ways. This is the first way. Um, by the type of it, or by the department, if you will. Um, these are the financial information return categories, uh, general government protection, transportation. And within your financial statements, if you're unsure of what's included in those, um, there is towards the back of the municipality's financial statements. It does tell you what's included in these categories. Um, but all in all, you had a budget of just over 17 million and your total expenses came in at $17.2 million. And then again, just showing you where uh, those expenses fall. Uh, probably no surprise, but 37% being in transportation, 20% in protection, and 13.7, which is environmental, which includes your water and sewer. And then this is the second way we are required to show your statement or your expenses. And uh, this is more the type of expense. So salary and benefits, interest charges. And again, it's going to come to the, it comes to the exact same numbers we just saw, just over $17 million in total expenses. And then again, um, seeing salary and benefits are about 34.9%, materials 22%, and contracted services 17%. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to address any questions. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm really hoping I can stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you, Ms. Park. I will turn the floor over to members of council who have questions of clarification for you. Members of council? Getting off lucky tonight, Joanna. Oh, <laughs> uh, hopefully they're still awake, Mayor. They are, they're awake. <laughs> <laughs> Saw their heads move. <laughs> I have a motion moved by Councillor Butwell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Anderson, that Council receive the auditor's report from Joanna Park of Baker, Tilly, and Associates. Questions or comments from members of Council? All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. Joanna, thank you very much for your presentation and, and to your firm for the audit, uh, but also thanks to our finance team. I know it's a ton of work in the background to prepare everything for the auditor to come and uh, I know um, every year we get uh, we get kudos from our auditors about how prepared you and your team are, um, Director Whittefield. So thank you for that. Yeah, Joanna's Joanna's family is lovely. But... Oh, can you see them? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, yeah, I cannot. I'm going to have to just uh, control alt delete to get out of the meeting. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I do not have the button. I, I find in some. We, some might be able, it, we might be able to eject you here. <laughs> yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> I apologize for that. Well, that's okay. Is there any reason that she would want to be here for the reading of the bylaw? It's actually actually just a report okay. and I can provide okay. that information to her. Thank you. Our next presentation is Heather Ratz and Bob Burke from the Brighton Public Library Board. CEO, chair, welcome back to Brighton Council.
<laughs> he keeps saying he's retiring from this. He keeps coming back, so I'm starting to not believe him. Makes me regret that nice presentation I did for you, by the way. <laughs> he's actually upset that he didn't get a uh, counter. <laughs> We're all upset that we didn't get a helmet, <laughs> Mr. Burke. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for having us here. As you know, uh, Heather and I uh, try and get to the council meetings uh, during the year to bring everybody up to speed on what the library is doing because it, it is a, a very important asset for the, the town of uh, Brighton. So uh, we're going to uh, split this, this up into two parts. Of the 15 minutes, I get a minute and a half, and, and Heather gets the other 14 and a half minutes. Anyway, uh, the first part of the thing is there is a difference between the board and the library. And uh, because we have uh, new uh, members of, of council, uh, we felt that it was a good chance and a good opportunity for us to, to bring you uh, into the picture of uh, just where the library fits in to the municipality and how it fits into the municipality. As you can see uh, on the board or on the slides up there, we are a municipal board. We are not a committee. We are a registered charity and we are a municipal partner and collaborator. The collaborator actually is a library word. I had to ask uh, Heather what the hell it was anyway. So, you know, so we are not a municipal department, we are not municipal employees, and we are not unionized. Can I have the next slide? What I'm going to do is very quickly is uh, fit you into how we fit into the, the uh, municipality. Obviously, municipal bylaws apply to us. Uh, however, we have something called the Ontario Public Libraries Act which if, if you want to read it, then uh, you have a spare moment, uh, we can provide you with it. Sometime when you didn't, don't have anything really exciting to do, you can read the Public Library Act because it is a, a convoluted and uh, very, uh, uh, and it's a thick, uh, so, but it can be provided for you, uh, particularly the, uh, the new counselors and probably the old counselors who haven't read it either, but, uh, but, um, we come under the Ministry of Health, or I'm sorry, Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Cultural Industries. So that's okay. I don't have any problem with that. But we got a board of trustees. Uh, this is where it gets a little complicated with the board of trustees is that uh, according to the, the Library Act, the municipality appoints members of the, the uh, library board. Uh, this has been a, a bit of a thorn, uh, but we've ironed this out uh, in the last couple of years uh, uh, through uh, Candace uh, and myself uh, having uh, some good conversation without breaking any of the laws. Uh, it, it is a it is a funny thing that you know that the library doesn't interview and pick its own. Uh, uh, personnel to be on the board, but that's the library act when we live with it. We've ironed out this problem and Candace has uh, been a real asset to us on that idea. The board of trustees is uh, in Brighton has nine people. We have seven that come from the public and we have two that come from the council and the council bylawed this some years ago that you would have two permanent members all the time on the board. And that, that is a, a very good ratio. Uh, uh, and we uh, appreciate uh, the new uh, people coming on board uh, to the board. We, I, I, there we go again, so it's not me. Uh, the board will be uh, happy to have the, the, the new people on the uh, on the board. Uh, uh, they, they bring a lot of information to the board and, and get it back to the to council. But the board of trustees, of course, come from the, uh, from the, from the uh, the public, and uh, the uh, I, I don't know where we stand right now with it, but I'm sure we'll iron this all out by January, the, our first meeting in January, their first meeting in January. I'll be sitting home watching television. Um, however, uh, 
my three and a half minutes is up. So I'm going to turn this over to the real workhorse of the, the in, in, just before you push the button, don't to touch that. I, I want you to, the, the one thing about governance, the, the library board is a governance board, period. All our job is to do is to make sure that the library is run according to what the law says it has to be run. We do not step on one another's toes. Uh, Heather runs the library efficiently, and we're very happy to have her and very glad that she's here. The, the board looks after only that things are being done according to the rules, but the two do not mesh together. Uh, we stay off her business and she stays out of the board business and we get along fine. Uh, and it's been a, a real joy having Heather and I'm gonna turn her over to, I, I'd even give her the big seat here so she can talk to you. Thank you, Bob. That's a difficult act to follow, but um, why not follow it with cats? So let's talk about how the library operates um, very quietly and with cats. And if you believe that, um, you haven't been in the library lately because unfortunately we don't have cats. Um, <laughs> But we do, uh, they do feature prominently. Libraries are not the quiet libraries like they were years ago. And that's a good thing. It means it's active. People are there to gather and do whatever they need to do. Uh, next slide, please. But seriously, though, how do we operate? We operate with an exceptional staff team of 10. We have five full-timers and five part-timer and casual staff. We operate two branches. We do have our branch here in this building. We also have a branch in Codrington that serves our rural community. And we get a ton of public support. That's how we operate. We continue to hear what the public wants and needs, and we put that uh, into action. Our vision is to connect, enrich, and inspire. We also want people to be discoverers and explorers, and that's what we hope that they get when they come in to the library. Hopefully it's a new adventure every time you visit the library. We value barrier-free service and equal access to all library materials and services. And of course, we have to talk about money. So how are we funded? Mainly through the municipality of Brighton through property taxes and a good chunk from development charges. We do get government grants from the Ministry of Heritage that Bob mentioned. We also get donations from the public and other streams of funding include book sales, lost and damaged items, non-resident fees, and that sort of thing. We are fine free as of January 1st of this year because we believe that fines are a barrier to service and we wanted to knock that down. So quite often we hear people say, well, the library is irrelevant because I buy my books at chapters or on Amazon or I have an e-reader. And that is so far from the truth that we are only about books. We are so much more than books. We are a safe and welcoming space. And that's perhaps one of the main things that staff are really proud of, that people feel safe to come into the library and they fe feel welcome each and every time. We are an ideal pickup and drop off location. For example, the water samples, the buy local passports that are happening right now and surveys that often come out for the public. We are accessible both physically and we, we believe that we have something for everybody and we want to have that. So we have dementia friendly cognitive care kits and we are dyslexic friendly, dyslexia friendly, I should say. And we're trying to be more accessible in terms of digital resources. So we have tons of digital resources. You can get crafty, you can research your ancestry, you can learn a new language. We have park passes for free. You can check out a park pass and go to one of our beautiful parks in this province. We have musical instruments. So perhaps 
you would like to take up the ukulele. We have 10 ukuleles uh, in the library, but we're also a partner with the Sterling Musical Instrument Lending Library. So many instruments and equipment at our fingertips. And I wanted to add a few fun statistics here from 2021. We circulated, or sorry, we had uh, just over 3,300 active card holders. Active means that they use the card within the last two years. We circulated just under 50,000 physical items and just over 24,000 digital items. And keep in mind that these are pandemic numbers. So normally these numbers would be even higher. We hosted 118 programs and unfortunately we employed zero cats, but I'm gonna look at that further for the next year because Bob won't be there. <laughs> I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you both. I'll open the floor to questions of clarification from members of council. Before the, the, uh, the four Never new, mind. The four, <laughs> the four new councillors, uh, uh, we encourage you to come down to the library and have a tour and get a talk and meet some of the staff. Uh, I belong to the Rotary Club and the uh, Provost Club, and every day I get comments and compliments of our staff. And I think you should come down when the time's uh, right for you uh, and have a, a tour of the, of the facilities and uh, uh, learn something about the library. Uh, we're very proud of it. Perhaps in the new year, we could uh, um, we organize have, a tour. We could have a picnic. Um, or perhaps we could include it in the municipal tour. Would that be possible, Madam Clerk? We can try. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good idea. We'll try to coordinate that. That'd be great. Um, we do have one. We have an exceptional library. We really do, and an exceptional library staff too. So, Heather, you're uh, as the leader of that ship. Uh, congratulations to you. It's a it's a good crew. Really good crew. Members of council, question of clarification. Council Rally. Can I make a comment? Well, all right. Well, thank you. Because I I um, having sat there for the past four years and feeling lucky to be sitting there again to work with the board um the first thing bob we are going to miss you for sure but um, i'm sure you'll show up now and again just to make sure that we're running the ship as you would like to see it run um but uh also i i would like to also congratulate the staff that we have over the last the, during the pandemic it was tough it was tough and um i want to say the library stepped up where they could they helped us with uh our Canada Day celebrations a few years ago. They've um, supported us with a lot of things. Christmas parade, any any anywhere they could, they were there um, to help the the uh, different committees that we have. And uh, Heather, it's not often said enough, but uh, as the mayor said, please take our um, our our compliments back to you back to the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilden. Also, a comment. Uh, congratulations to your team on being nominated for yet another award. And and when will we hear the exciting results? We hope uh, February second. So we've been shortlisted for a ministry award for innovation for the work that two staff members did on helping our patrons to learn from home. So February 2nd is the awards gala and uh, fingers crossed that uh, we bring home some hardware. And if we don't, that's okay, but I'm pretty sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping. Uh, CEO, are you concerned about um, development charges and, and what Bill 23 means uh, from a development charge point of view? I absolutely am. It is a current topic throughout Ontario with the library CEOs. I have it on my calendar to attend the meeting on January 4th. And that's a that's upwards of 30,000 for the library budget for the last couple of years. And that's to purchase uh, books and e-resources. So to lose that would be devastating. Thank you. Will, will you be sure to circle back with municipal staff? Um, we are... Um, we're doing uh, some some consultations, if you will, with the province, and um, we would like to be able to include your comments 
find concerns with that. So uh, who's the lead on that? Is that you, Director Walsh? Yeah. So either either Director Whittefield, Director Walsh, or both. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I might add that uh, you know on the board there is a, a a position for a finance. Of course, we don't have one, and uh, Heather, with all her other duties running the library, does all our budgets and all our financing, which. Uh, I honestly don't think uh, there is anybody else that's going to do any better job for us. Thank you for that, Bob. Um, Find free library, exciting. That's exciting. I, I know it's not the first in Ontario uh, uh, experience, but how is it going? How are, how are your return rates? And so on any concerns? Uh, great. We haven't really had any issues. There, The only issue has been some people will keep their items overdue for longer than they normally would have, but we have capped that so that they can't use their card. So that's a bit of a barrier if they don't bring it back. But we also call them personally and say, you know, this is overdue. And usually it's, you know, they've got tons of stuff going on. They've got tons of kids books and oh yes, they're gonna return them. So it's been fine, um, <laughs> pun intended. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people don't know that we're fine free. And when we tell them, oh, don't worry, I, you brought it back late that's okay we don't have fines then they feel guilty and they give us a donation so yeah, we appreciate fine, that <laughs> it's like an administrative monetary penalty <laughs> without the penalty part any other questions for members of council i have a motion moved by councillor freda seconded by councillor butwell that council received the presentation from heather rat ceo and bob burke chair of the brighton public library board questions or comments on the motion all in favor being none opposed, that motion's carried. Thank you both for your presentation. Madam Clerk, are you aware of any citizens' comments this evening? None. Brings us to staff reports. The first report is the 2021 financial statement approval report. Director Whittefield, we read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Wielden, that Council approves the 2021 audited financial statements as presented by Baker, Tilly, KDN, LLP, and authorizes the mayor and treasurer to sign the management report on behalf of the municipality. Any questions or comments? All those in favor, being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next report is the 2022 year end reserve transfer report. Director Whittefield, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Not at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Wielden. The council received the staff report regarding the 2022 year end reserve transfer and further that the following contributions be made to reserves in 2022 to be utilized in 2023 or future years. One unspent portion of surface treatment road projects of approximately $377,000. Two heat pump replacement at 35 Alice Street, $12,000. Three unspent tax support portion of the HVAC replacement at 35 Alice Street, $5,628. Four, tax support portion of the self-contained breathing apparatus, $30,000. Five, unspent tax support portion of engineering, approximately $67,000. Six, tax support portion of Applewood Drive, $111,488. Tax support portion of parking lot, pardon me, seven, tax support portion of parking lot east of Veterans Way and west of Sobeys, $321,872. Eight, unspent tax support portion of Parks Master Plan, up to $50,000. Nine, tax support portion of Presque Hill Government Dock Improvements, $5,000. Ten, funds collected for calendar distribution by Brighton Digital Archives, $409.20. Eleven, tax support portion of the official plan, public engagement, $12,500. Questions or comments from members of council? Council Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess my concern with some of these, when I look at some of the uh, road projects and the paving, um, it's a good idea to put them away and hopefully do them next year. I just wonder how much farther behind the eight ball we're going to get. Um, you know, we're gonna be adding more projects during budget season, I'm sure. It was a 
will it be overwhelming for our uh, public works department to try to to catch up on all of this stuff you're referring to number one the unspent portion of surface treatment road projects the parking lots um uh yeah the um the engineering stuff you know we're, so uh, we, we seem to be getting more behind instead of ahead that um, Mr. Whiteman's on screen. I assume Director Whittefield, you'd rather Mr. Whiteman try to tackle that question. Yes, um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have had a meeting today. We have everything on schedule, we believe. We don't see anything that's unforeseen. So um, everyone's reported today in terms of uh, schedules and uh, what we are going to do for next year. So you're confident, Mr. Whiteman, that we will be able to spend these monies on the appropriate projects? Yes. In 2023? Yes. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? And if I can add to that, you, that's including what we tentatively have planned for a budget to go move forward this year. Mr. White? Yes, that's, yes. Um, yes. So something that'll come up in budget is perhaps uh, our our manpower. I won't bring it up as such. We don't, we don't say manpower anymore. No, our staffing levels. Staff manpower. Power. Yeah. Staff <laughs> power. Anyhow, boots on the ground. I think uh, perhaps maybe the, some of these projects might be able to get done in a more timely manner if we look at that. Uh, it's again, it's another cost that we ha would have to look at. But uh, I think at a time we uh, definitely had a serious look at it. Very well, um, so that's a discussion for budget time. Just a hint. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna park it for budget yes. time <laughs> because our our the motion before us is with regard to year end reserve transfers. Any questions from members of council? All those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next report is with regard to property to be assumed as a road allowance within the municipality of Brighton. Uh, I see that the author is uh, Mrs. Deck, but Director Walsh, do you have anything to add or highlight on this report? Nothing for the mayor. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Wielden, seconded by Councillor Wright. The council receives the staff report regarding property be to, to be assumed as road allowance and further that the council enacts a bylaw to assume the subject land dedications into the municipal road system. Questions or comments from members of council? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motions carried. Next report is council planning meeting schedule for 2023. Madam Clerk, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Not at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Wielden, seconded by Councillor Wright. The council received the staff report regarding council planning meeting schedule for 2023 and that the January 2023 meetings be changed to the following. Regular council meeting, Monday, January 9th. Council planning meeting, Monday, January 16th. Additional meetings, development charges meeting, January 4th. Committee of the whole meetings, January 11th, 17th, 30th. Those are for budget and public meeting at the February 6th council meeting. And further that staff be directed to advertise these changes. Questions or comments from members of council? Councilor Wielden. Uh, just to, to clarify the uh, January 16th meeting is the one that we talked about as a public meeting regarding the Gosport development. Okay. Right. So it, it, will be, it will be our typical Oh, might not be difficult, but it will be our normal council planning meeting, and it will include the statutory public meeting as as the last one did. But in this case, it will have the uh, that the intent. It's intended to have the Gosport development in there. Is that correct, Mr. Walsh? Yes, uh, Madam Clerk, we're authorizing you to advertise, and we've included the February sixth council meeting as a public meeting. What if council has not finished its budget by that point? And we won't advertise until such time as we know. I anticipate the public presentation will be much, a few weeks later than that in February. So I'd rather not nail that date down at so this point. As we get closer to 
a time when we're coming to the conclusion of budget, we will have a conversation about advertising. For sure, because yeah. I want council to have the time to, to go through the budget appropriately. As Thanks. do I, and that's why I asked the question. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right. So right now we're we're hopeful, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it would be realistic to expect that we'll go long, much longer than that. So, um, three three budget meetings don't seem like a whole lot, uh, especially for a new council. Yeah, yeah. Any further questions or comments, uh, Councilor Rowley? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to uh, go back to the Monday, January sixteenth planning meeting as well. Um, based on last week's meeting, there was much interest. Uh, from the folks uh, in Gosport, and I'm wondering if a change of venue might be required. That do we go to the community center so that we can accommodate all of those people? The the, the only reason I don't want to go to the community center is because the sound system's horrible. It just doesn't work very well, and I I prefer if we can accommodate everybody here that we do so. And I I think the clerk has a has a bit of a plan in place to do so. Would you like to speak to that? We will take down the tables at the back and bring up more tables. So that whole area there will be for gallery as well. Um, we can bring council in a little bit further just so that we can add some more chairs. Yeah. With with moving me up here, we can, we can I mean, come this way. Po post pandemic protocol, we can move out all, all of council this way and bring staff up a little closer to the front as well and give us a lot more room for a few more rows of seating. So. That, that's fine, yeah. but it's just, um, I hate to see us being overwhelmed and having people standing out in the lobby because they can't get in. That's just. I'm, I'm, equal, I'm equally concerned, but I'm, I just, that sound system so awkward <laughs> at the community center. Need to add that to the budget process. What, a larger council chamber? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yeah. People will be here. I mean, even even the ones that zoom in will zoom in, but we know people will be here. We we saw people here, even though we weren't making a decision on the on the application. So we can anticipate at least that many people coming. At least. Any further questions on the motion? All those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. brings us to our consent agenda any member of council wishing to remove an item for discussion may do so um, and now would be a good time if there's anything you'd like to talk about outside of the consent so i have a motion moved by councillor wielden second by councillor wright be it resolved the staff recommendation with respect to items 10.1 10.2 and 10.3 be adopted as printed. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. We have no notices of motions or motions. We have no unfinished business listed on this agenda. I'm to see if anyone else disagrees. We have. Um, a bylaw to read, and it's the assuming bylaw. I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Wielden. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to assume certain portions of land for public use as roadways within the boundary of the corporation of the municipality at Brighton. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion is carried. Which takes us to reports of advisory committees of council reports, minutes, and council reports. Uh, the one before us comes from the Accessibility Committee. A special meeting was held on December 9th. It's moved by Council Rowley. Seconded by Councillor Wielden, the Council approved the recommendation of the Accessibility Advisory Committee dated December 9th, 2022, 
and that this matter be included in the 2023 budget deliberations. Is there any discussion? Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Just uh, are they just looking? Is the committee just looking to have the line by line items within their budget, or or no. are they looking to have this in the whole municipal budget? They are looking to have uh, separated line items for accessibility purposes in in departmental budgets across the municipality, so that we can identify what projects have been done for accessibility purposes in the municipality. Any further questions? Those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. We have no reports or minutes of statutory committees, boards, and external agencies, which brings us to correspondence, direction items, endorsements, communications, and petitions. The only piece of correspondence comes from the Alzheimer's Society for the Declaration of Alzheimer's Awareness Month. It's moved by Councilor Rowley, seconded by Councilor Wielden. The council supports or receives the request from Trish Clancy, Alzheimer's Society, to proclaim January as Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Councilor Rowley, Councilor Wielden, you're okay with that? I have circled supports. Is there any discussion from members of council? All those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. We have no FYI correspondence, which brings us to question period. Are there any questions from members of the public? Is there anyone coming in virtually? No. We have no in-camera session this evening, which brings us to our confirmatory bylaw moved by Councilor Butwell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Anderson, that council gives a bylaw. It's first, second, and third reading and finally passes on this date being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton Council meeting held on December 19th, 2022. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. And we will end with a motion moved by Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Wielden, that December 19th council meeting adjourn at 7.52 p.m. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? And with a Merry Christmas, I declare that motion carried.